I guess I'll thank everyone for coming today. Not Friday, even though I keep thinking it's Friday. So. <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, I'm feeling Filling in for Jessica, who is out on leave. So uh, apologies in advance in, in case I screw anything up. Um, today, I figured uh, we'd start with uh, Jennifer, who has graciously just uh, volunteered to be our presenter today on the documentation uh, presentation. And then if there's time, I guess at the end, we can talk about future topics. Um, and then I did go through the bugs and kind of pulled out ones that were fairly new in case people want to look at any of them, but um, I will turn it over to Jennifer. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, the majority of people on this call are directly involved with the documentation pro uh, project, but I'll talk about um, where it's come from and where we're at and where we're going. Um, it was an accidental project. <laughs> Um, I ended up doing a webinar on more than just cloning the template and realized that our documentation didn't really have a lot for editing or creating templates. Um, so I ended up extensively rewriting our local documentation um, last fall um, and also like in the process learned more about the reporter than I'd ever known before. Um, and you know, once I had that new documentation, I wanted to contribute it back to the community. And I was a little hesitant at first to just kind of take my docs and plop them over the community docs until I looked at the community docs and realized that a lot of them were the original Sitka docs that I had just rewritten on our end. Um, so some of the documentation currently in the community docs is from 2009. <laughs> Um, I think some of this is due to the reporter not really substantially changing in that time. Um, I know we have the reporter rewrite coming. Um, I'm not sure what version, if there's a version that that's targeted to yet, but three point something or maybe four point something. Um, and also I think, you know, Dig's been focusing on a bunch of different things. And I think there was just nobody in Dig who was looking at reports until I was like, sure, I'll do a webinar on this. Um, and I just want to, uh, I can just share my screen here. And let it open in the right thing. So you can see what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. Are you able to do that or can I just give you links? Because either works. You are muted. Sorry, I'll make you the host. It doesn't give okay. me an option to do co-host. Um, if you make me the host, will it cause problems with the recording? Hmm. That I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I could just throw them in the chat if you can share. Sure. Yeah, let's do that just to be safe. Okay. Uh, so here's the first one. And this is just, oh, did that go? Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so this is just our current docs. Um, I kind of touched everything, but the main pieces that substantially changed was the report template editor section um, because it didn't exist before. <laughs> um, but then if we take a look at uh, what is currently in the man, uh, sorry, in the official docs, Um, you can tell by the date stamps that the uh, screenshots were created sometime around 2009. Um, and uh, they actually, it actually references some of our real libraries. 
which we don't do for screenshots anymore. Um, so it'll be good to get that shifted over to more up-to-date documentation. Um, so we write our documentation in ASCII doc, which is what the community uses, which is why we write our docs in ASCII doc. Um, but before docs could be added to the community docs, they needed to be de Sitka, um, both the code, the, or I guess all the code, the text and the screenshots. Um, cause we have a bit of a different style guide than dig does. And within our docs, we say things like contact co-op support or such, which doesn't apply for the community. Um, so as you may remember, I put out a, a request back in May for help. Um, and Susan Morrison, Beth Willis, and Elizabeth David, and uh, sorry, Davis and Jessica Wolford all stepped forward to help. And we have this uh, 45 page document that we've been working on, um, which has all of the code for the docs um, from us. And uh, Susan, Beth, Elizabeth, and Jessica have gone through and updated things where it says co-op support or question things where I've said, we say you should do this. And like, is this actually a recommendation that the community wants to make? Or is this more of a Sitka thing? Um, and it sounds like there's been a few places where um, we want to have those kind of recommendations out to the community and others where it really is um, a very Sitka specific thing. Um, so I think we are almost done. You've all done an amazing job reviewing the documentation um, because I must admit, I kind of put it into the Google Doc, shared it, and then uh, went on to a conference and then went on vacation. <laughs> So I appreciate you all uh, digging into this. Um, I think there's a few discussion points that are still um, needing of some discussion, um, but I do think we're really close to being able to actually contribute the code back to the community docs. Um, and that's on my list for the dig meeting next week to ask people like possibly Andrea for assistance to figure out why Git won't work for me so we can put reports in. It doesn't have to be Andrea, it can be others. <laughs> you wouldn't be asking me that if you saw the hot mess I made of my own commits last week. But <laughs> You're making commits. I Git isn't letting me get that far right now. So, <laughs> um, and of course, you know, once the docs are in the community docs, they're not permanent. Um, if people find an issue, we can update them, though, as you can see, uh, things don't always get updated uh, right away. Um, but I think if interest groups, uh, you know, take an, a part of ownership in the documentation that's related to the interest group in reviewing it and notice, you know, noting when things are out of date, um, even if there's nobody in the interest group who can make those commits, um, having those uh, reported to Launchpad as doc bugs or sent to the documentation list um, means that somebody with the ability to make those changes um, knows that the change needs to be made. Uh, one other link here. Uh, a much bigger project that DIG has had ongoing for quite some time is reviewing and reorganizing the entire documentation. You can see it says uh, 2022 there. Um, so we're now into year two. Um, and so uh, for things like reports, um, going through reviewing the sections and even just saying, yes, this is accurate. No, this isn't accurate. Um, is helpful. Um, so a couple things that I found when I was uh, looking at 
the doc where, where we're looking at the code, if you could switch back, Elizabeth, um, just based uh, from some of the comments and such. Um, so the report search is not included in our documentation because I don't use it and I forgot to do it. <laughs> so uh, if there's any additional information about that report search or if it should be a section, um, definitely something that we should look at adding because, yeah, I just forgot about it. Um, there's also uh, somewhere in the running reports section, uh, there's the fact that there's pivot label columns and pivot data columns. Uh, I have just always taken the information from previous docs because I don't actually know how that works. Um, so if anybody has more insightful information to add to that, uh, please do. Um, and then one that I think is a, a discussion we need to have is the hard-coded filters. Um, and there was some discussion in the doc about um, uh, in, in Sitka, we actually have a table where we talk about the commonly used hard-coded filters that we use, um, but whether or not that is useful and should be adjusted for the community. Um, I think it's pretty, it's, it's under the running report section. I had to go back to our actual docs to find it because I couldn't remember where it was. Um, is this it? It is on, will you give me a page number? Uh, it's on page 11. I think it was that bright, yeah. Um, so in our documentation, we talk about hard coding filters, like excluding anything where the call number is minus one to exclude pre-cats. Um, we also do filters uh, like excluding deleted items or excluding deleted patrons. Um, and a lot of our templates will include those kind of hard-coded filters. Um, do others use hard-coded filters in their reports? I'm seeing Elizabeth nod. Yeah, for pails, we do, whenever we do like patron or item ones, we definitely do the is deleted. We, um, and then the active flag one sometimes, depending on the situation. Yeah, um, we'll recommend it in similar circumstances, you know, when people are building reports. Um, I, I think the suggestion that Beth made in the comment is, is good about, like, you know, you may set hard-coded filters here and just be aware that you won't be able to change them when you run the actual report. Yeah. So but that sort of comes down to a local practice decision. So it sounds like it makes sense to adjust the section and keep it in. Uh, if I can find my list again. Um, in the report template editor section, I fully made up names for the sections. Um, <laughs> because I needed something to refer them to them by. Um, if there's names that others would prefer we use, I, I have no, you know, attachment necessarily to these names. I just came up with what seemed to be logical. Um, I think it's still a bit further down because that's recurring reports. And it's running. Um, Is that the one I'm looking for? No, uh, report Editing. template editor. I think you're quite yeah. a bit further down to go. There we go. Report template editor. Um, so I 
labeled the three sections basic information, which is like the title, description, uh, documentation URL, then the display field and filter selector, because that's the middle bit where you can select things. And then the display field and filter tabs, because there's the two tabs at the bottom. Um, as I said, I have no great attachment to these names, but I needed something to be able to refer to them. Um, so if anybody has better names, please, um, please don't hesitate to say we should call this this instead. I will probably end up renaming some of them after the re Angular reports anyway. Yeah, Just... I was assuming we there would be some shifts with that. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited because I think based on the specs that it'll be easier to document because things will actually be chunked out in a logical way that they're not always right now in the reporter. Yes. And if we have time at the end of this meeting, I actually uh, want to show you guys a little preview and ask your input as the reports interest group on, on a thing. Ooh. Or two. I feel like we'll have time. I don't have a ton more. Um, the one other uh, place I wanted to highlight was the template terminology, which is, I think, almost at the end of the doc, Elizabeth. Um, this is again a case where like I took the information that was available, put it in, checked with some of our people, but I don't actually fully understand all of it myself. Um, I think I think it's like almost the last page. There we go, template terminology. So for the data types and the uh, I think it's, data types, operators, transforms, and such. I've included the most common ones we use, but there may be others that I didn't include because we don't commonly use them. So I don't necessarily know how they work and uh, wasn't sure how what to write as a description for them. Um, so uh, please, if you have more knowledge in that area than I do, um, reviewing that section and you know checking to see if the information is actually accurate um, and if there's additional information that could be added to be helpful would be great. Um, once we get to the database side of it, my knowledge uh, has some gaps. Um, so around the commonly used tables and the core sources, as well as that template terminology, um, those are sections that could probably do with somebody with more database knowledge, taking a look and making sure everything makes sense. We can look on that when we redo or when we re-implement things for, for Reporter. Excellent. And everything in the docs about nullability, I learned from Jessica's conference presentation. Um, hopefully I took the information and put it accurately into the docs. Um, but I also included a link in our docs to the actual presentation because there was more in it than I could figure out how to put into the docs. Um, any mistakes are my own, um, but I can now actually create and edit templates that use nullability, which I couldn't before. So uh, I think that's great. Um, so I think, as I said, I think we're really close. I think there's a few things to tidy up, some sections that could do with some additional review, but I think also we could just put it into the community docs and then make further changes as people um, point out issues or places where they'd like clarification at it. Um, so that's my goal next week is to figure out how to actually get my Git working so I can push it back to the community docs. Uh, any questions about any of it? 
there's a lot in it. It turned out to be a 45 page doc. Thank you. Um, so if anybody wants to volunteer to do like a second pass, do they should they just reach out to you directly? I mean, the link is in the uh, agenda um, okay. and it's the one that allows editing. So okay. pop in to the doc. Um, one other thing that I just wanted to show, I don't think it necessarily will work for the docs, but it's been really helpful for us. So I just wanted to share it. Um, we recently did some cleanup and we stopped all recurring reports at the beginning of August that were run off non-staff accounts, accounts that don't have reporter permissions or deleted staff accounts. Um, because over the years, we've discovered that there are uh, accounts that fit all three of those criteria that had recurring reports running. Um, and part of that was getting libraries to reset up recurring reports that were running off old staff accounts. Um, and we actually used the um, the report to show reports so that everybody could um, uh, everybody could take a look at what was actually being run at their library and figure out if they were still running necessary reports and if the reports were actually run by current staff members. Um, so that report was super helpful. Um, and some of our libraries did have to set up new recurring reports. Um, and so we actually created this appendix to show how to set up some common reports because Recurring reports is a spot where a lot of people um, who aren't using the reporter on a regular basis or aren't super comfortable with the reporter run into problems. Um, so we've set up the report definitions with exactly what it should look like, the steps to do it. And we've done that for um, a bunch of our really commonly run uh, recurring reports um, or other ones that have odd date things often that you need some extra explanation. Um, as I said, because it's specific to our reports, I don't think it's something that would really work in the community docs, but it's been really handy for us, especially for um, staff who don't have that level of comfort and familiar familiarity with the reporter, um, because it's made having them set up their own recurring reports a whole lot easier. Um, so I just wanted to share it because it's uh, we set it up in June um, and it's so far definitely been worth the time uh, it took to put it together. So that's my cool thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. It is very cool. One thing to make sure that it's edited before we put it to the community is those include statements. Um, I don't think they'll break anything. I think they'll just be ignored, but they're they're irrelevant I, to the new docs builder. The XREF ones? No, like so oh. anything that's include colon colon include yeah, right right at the top colon colon and they're also on each section header um so yeah the the toc the table of contents is generated in antora um you know by just the toc and mm -hmm. just the, at the very top you just do toc like that and and yeah it does that based on section headers automatically um but yeah that's just that's a very very minor cleanup thing but no, um, but that's really good to know, Andrea, because I because you guys have are still not using done a, the old docs builder. Yeah, right. We yeah. still do um, docbook, right? So, yeah, and uh, I think Susan went through and changed all the headers because we use the other um, option for the headers than dig. Uh, but there's probably some other code things that we'll need to just double check. Um. And possibly also strip out the index terms that we have in there, um, which is what's in the uh, parentheses. Yeah. Um, because we do have an index in the community docs, but it's but it broken. Is entirely blank right now. Yes. No, I know. Yes. I filed a bug about that like a long time ago. 
Uh, I have no <laughs> idea. I have no idea how to unbreak it. I, 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 I got nothing. Uh, I think it would have to be like Blake or somebody who knows about the Antora yeah. builder. Um, but that doesn't mean we should strip index terms. I feel like we should, in the, in the interest of hope, that there might I someday mean, be an index. As long as it's not going to break it, we can um, definitely leave them in. Let me double check the index formatting okay. for Antora. Um, yeah, so reporter docs. Yay. And then we'll read, well, uh, uh, Equinox will redo them all again when the report <laughs> comes out. That's so, yeah, we, they will need to fix the syntax of the index term. Okay. But the good I news wonder... is you only need one. You don't have to do, um, you know, one, one set of index terms. Is it possible that that didn't get converted and that's why the index is broken? Let's look at a file. That's an excellent question. Well, no, because see, I've added docs since then with properly formatted index terms and it's still not building the index okay. correctly. But now I'm curious, let's look at the, let's look at the old reporter documentation. Because I feel like if I'm yeah they did get converted okay they got converted because I'm feeling like if I'm remembering correctly Lynn did a big thing several years ago to get index terms in before we moved to Antora yeah and it looks so there's like, definitely stuff that should be in the index yeah no I'm seeing that they're correct in the correct format um yeah this is also in many different pages so that'll be another thing that just to split it up into the individual pages and each of the section headings should actually be a top level heading which it looks like you've done yeah so yeah yeah and they'll, they'll just each be in their own document yeah and there's um one of the other things when we do put it in is there are there's some parts of the existing reporter docs that it replaces but there's also some of the existing reporter docs that it doesn't. Um, for example, starting and stopping the reporter daemon, I did not even mm -hmm. touch that because yeah. I'm assuming their instructions are correct because that's not something I do. Um, as well as exporting report templates using PHP PGA admin um, and the simple reports. So we will replace chunks of it, but not mm -hmm. the entirety. Right. Um, and if anybody in the reports interest group has the knowledge and the time to take a look at the docs that aren't being replaced, um, those are great ones to note on the uh, documentation review and reorg if they're accurate or not. Um, I feel like simple reports, we can probably say yes, because I'm pretty sure that one was um, relatively recent and was, I want to say Equinox docs, Andrea. Excellent. Yeah. Um, but the exporting and the stopping and starting the reporter um, would be good to have those reviewed and make sure they're still accurate as well. Or note that they're not. All right. Well, that's me. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. This was fun to read through all the documentation too. So, um, Andrea, did you want to um, share something? Yeah, but I don't want to start a riot. Um, so I mean, I might ask you some controversial questions. Um, okay. so sure. Let's see. Um. So, oh, go ahead. Okay. No, I think I figured out how to let others share their screen. So I do see that I have the share screen button. So yeah, I will. Oh, and Zoom helpfully labels my monitors for me. Thank you, Zoom. Um, all right, can you see? 
new template. This is yep. so question one. So this is um the new template editor. Question one, where should these checkboxes go relative to their items? Now these are nullability checkboxes. I'm not going to get into that all right now because that is something that's currently being tested in my knowledge. So Jennifer, you said that you took your nullability paragraph from Jessica's presentation. So I, for our testers, wrote a paragraph on nullability. And then Mike Rylander was like, no, no, no. It's literally the opposite of what you wrote. So I'm not going to talk about nullability. <laughs> um, but uh, we do have, uh, so and I can show you another example of this from another new interface. This is uh, custom org unit trees. And it's, as you can see, it's the same layout, only it doesn't have like the lines next to it, but it's got the checkbox. And then these expand buttons on the inside of the checkbox. And so that's kind of similarly here, we wanna, you know, we've got like the little feed lines there to show you where you are. But um, that's my first question is checkbox placement. Yes, no, different, right, left, in the middle. No, not in the middle, but. The, I don't know if it necessarily applies here, but the consensus in the ACK interest group around checkboxes was we think they should always be the farthest left so that it's consistent throughout Evergreen. Okay, so in that case, you go with this, where the arrow, it's checkbox arrow, as opposed to this, where it's arrow checkbox. I think so. Do okay. others have thoughts about that? I mean, this is why I'm asking is because this is an area where there can be legitimate disagreement. And uh, both of these interfaces were written by Stephanie. <laughs> so, you know, one is one way, one is the other way, but we'd really dearly love to we're also kind of working on this piece of EG tree by itself. And so what we want to do is pick one EG tree method. So every time you have a tree, it's going to look like this, tr the tree. So like we've got two very slightly differing. Actually, I wonder if I do this, if I tile, can you guys see both tiles? Or are you only seeing one? I'm just seeing one so far. Oh, yeah. Well, it also makes it ugly because it collapses. It. Okay. So, yeah. So, this is, you know, checkboxes. This is arrows on the inside, checkboxes on the outside, no lines. And this is checkboxes on the inside, arrows on the outside, and with lines. So, our, our goal is to unify these um, so that the EG tree component always shows the same thing wherever it's implemented. So, that's why I just wanted to know, you know, yes, no lines and the, the positioning of the, the arrows versus the check boxes. I think um, I like in, the lines. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, I was just gonna say in the current, when you look at the nullability, it's the arrow and then the, the nullability box and then the, the term. So I can see why you're doing it this way because it looks consistent with how it is now. But I feel like if you're already doing checkbox arrow everywhere else, it would make sense to be consistent across the board. Well, yeah, this is, so this is, like I said, gonna be a re-implementation of EG tree in general. So this will be everywhere there's a tree, not just reports. Oh, not just reports. Okay. So, but I'll write down, yes, to the line. I like the lines too, um, because they, I feel like when I'm looking at this without the lines, it looks crooked, even though it's not. The lines are like, no, no, you're just have, you just have terrible vision. The lines are straight. Um, well, and the other thing is the like in item status and check in and check out and all by default, the checkbox is the farthest thing to the left, except sometimes the numbers of like the, the line right. numbers. Yes, that which is I true. I think is why everybody in acquisitions was like, yeah, we want the checkbox on the other side of the cover art. <laughs> Yeah, and in that case, I get it because that's also, there's a big thing in between the mm -hmm. left edge, the checkbox, whereas this is kind of more of just like a fiddly yeah. little, you know. But I really like the idea of it being consistent throughout yes. Evergreen. Exactly. Um, so I'll show you one more time. So I know I don't have one with lines and checkboxes in the correct order, but so this would be, and we're going to fix this padding, obviously, so that these don't, so that that isn't squashed up all like that. Um, 
but yeah, so it would be like this with the check boxes and then the arrow on the inside, but it'll have, it'll have the lines. Um, you know, like when you check lines, the box that is lines like, like that. that has things underneath it, does it select all of that or does it just like does it select the system or does it select no. the system and the branches it's in in this interface as well as reports it is individual okay. selections i mean you wouldn't want to do this in reports but... no you wouldn't want to do that in reports. <laughs> but yeah it's it does not cascade that in both in both cases so Because again, in both cases, you want to be individually manipulating things. Uh, oh, thank you, Beth. Beth just on it says, I don't have a strong preference as long as it's consistent. I like the lines. Yeah. I guess to play devil's advocate here, uh, my one little comment on the, um, if the check box is before the arrow, is it does look inconsistent, I guess, within the tree, just because there's not an arrow next to everything um but i also okay don't really have a strong preference right now so i'm going back and forth but i also i do like the lines but that's a valid that's a valid point how do i clear my drawings here can i just refresh it no they're still there uh, <laughs> uh uh annotate clear clear up my drawings okay yeah no that's a good point um because you know like so these are all three at the same level, right? But like these two have an arrow and this one does not. So their text does not align. Um, so that's, that's you know, a valid criticism. And there's another example of that. Could the text align? I don't know. Um, let me see. Because I'm with Susan that like, it does cause some dis like visual display issues if the if the arrow is missing and the checkbox is on the other side of it. So you would want to see the text like so for example, branch two to be padded so there would be a blank space here and that the texts would line up. Mm -hmm. Well, so that every um everything on the same level is indented the same amount. Well, so you but can... the text is indented the same amount, you mean? Yeah, sorry, the text yes. is intent. Yeah. So that would be, there would be a blank space here in between the checkbox and the text so that the, the, both the checkboxes and the text would align, mm -hmm. right? Okay, let me see. And I think we'd still want that even if the checkbox, like even if the checkbox and the arrow were reversed because we still want everything that's at the same level to line up so that it's easy to see. Because otherwise, I assume that something is like if the text is indented, is not indented, I assume that's the level above. Just, you know, thinking about how bulleted lists. Yeah. And it, th that's how, so you can see there is a space. Yeah. There. I like that better with the space. But you want to flip the checkbox on the arrow. Maybe. Maybe. So my opinion is I actually like this implementation better. Um, because to me, both the tree component and the arrow component are kind of like navigation. So it makes sense in my brain to tie them together. Um but yeah, no, I, I but having read the bugs about you know, act wanting things all the way to the left. And also, you know, the points about item status and checkout, all, every other, all the, all the grid interfaces having the checkbox all the way to the far left. I, I that is also a valid point. Um, but I think we could also argue that the lines and the arrows are the equivalent of like the line numbers, which are sometimes to the left of the checkboxes. That's true. So I think I've been persuaded. <laughs> Have you have you talked yourself around to the other? Conclusion? I think Susan's talked me around. Okay, okay. 
Um, because these are, I mean, these, this is not a grid. Neither of these are grid interfaces. These are tree interfaces. So they're, they're, they're going to be different. So. But I think you definitely need this, the padding like in reports. Yeah. So that everything lines up. Right. Okay. So this, this, this way is, is the preferred way with the lines, with the arrows next to the lines, with the padding where there's no arrow with the checkbox and all this all lined up neatly and beautifully. Okay. Thank you for your input. Um, and Beth saying in the chat that she's convinced too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Well, the Susan, the Susan Morrison Memorial Alignment conversation, although I mean, not Memorial, that's because you're still with us. Um, sorry, I made a similar bad joke about myself this morning. Um, anyway, and but it was the context of like the devs killing me with with Jira. So <laughs> we prefer alignment as it is in words. So I have another, so that, that was the easy one, right? Okay. Um, I have another one that might be a little controversial. So one of the things that you can do now um, in, in the new reports interface is you can double click on things or you can double click on reports rather to open them. So here's some of the things that we have tested. Um, so you double click, oh, whoops, no, I'm wrong. Sorry. It's that so pretty. Keeps... I know, isn't it so pretty? I like almost <laughs> cried. I was, um, yeah, so this is the double click will show you output is based on, you know, a certain date. So here is what um, I am trying to show. I wanna show, oh, I wanna edit this, that's right, no. Sorry, I'm still learning this interface too. There we go, edit. Okay, so I'm editing the report. It takes me to the filters tab first, not the columns tab. Um, that's because it's a report, not a template, Andrea. I'm sorry, I'm on a bunch of cold meds. Let's look at a template instead. Test template. Now, what am I thinking of? Hold on, I'm sorry. I gotta go back and look at my notes because I'm doing this all wrong. Um, okay, well, I'll just look at the really pretty screen. Here, I'll go take you back to the pretty screen. There you go. Look at the pretty screens while I look up my notes. That's what it was, okay. So, our options here are, you know, clone, um, edit, et cetera, view, whatever, whatever. So, editing a report um, starts you on the filters because you can't edit the columns from. So, but is that cool? Would you prefer to start on the columns, which you can't edit, and then just have to go next? Um, ooh, that button's not working. Hold on, I just wanted to write that down so I could file a bug. This is literally like in partner testing right now. Like this has been in testing for like a week and a half. So we're still figuring out bugs. Next. And the people who are testing this are not super duper familiar with reports, which is why we are, wanted to ask you guys um, for some input as well. So when you're editing a report, what it does now is it just drops you right onto this filters tab. Um, and where we wanna know, is that good or bad? Would you want to have it drop you on the columns tab, even though you can't edit anything there, or just have it drop you on the filters tab from which you can then go to scheduling, which you can also edit. Um, 
it makes sense to go to the filters because that would be what I would want to change. Okay. Mm. And and when you edit a report now, that's all you can change. Right, but it's all in one. It's all in one thing. Yeah. Thing. So I we didn't know if it would be confusing to drop people into another. Um, oh my God. Sometimes I feel like I need three monitors. Um, can you go back to the filters for a moment? Yeah. I agree that it should take you to the filters page. I wonder, though, if you have a lot of filters and it pushes the previous next buttons off your screen, okay. if that's a problem. That's a good if point. You're, I mean, you should be able to then use the tabs. Yes. But you can. But that's a very good point. And that's actually relevant to the columns as well. If you've got a lot of columns, you know. You lose that next button. Yeah. And that's like super simple to put a duplicate set of buttons up at the top. Um, okay. And then the other piece of this was... Can I ask a question about oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. relative time value checkbox? Uh-huh. It just seems um, like out of place. Like it seems to like, in my head, it looks like it's disrupting the flow. Like okay. in my head, operator and then days ago, like those three boxes should be in alignment together display-wise. But I don't know where you would put relative the checkbox then in relation to that. We can... Or does it need to be that wide? Put it underneath there. Um, it you know I don't know, um, but okay. I can find out. Okay. Uh, That's just actually to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little funny. Um, I think it would look less weird as you're saying, Elizabeth, if it was underneath the days ago and or I'm days assuming ago was shorter and then you could fit it next to it like so it was all one line yeah. yeah some of the reason for the placement of these though has to do with tab order as well okay because um Stephanie will know, not let us write the terrible inaccessible interfaces of the past for which I am profoundly grateful um <laughs> but that okay. sometimes can implement in impact where things are placed but I will absolutely ask about that um, Which sure. makes sense because you need to check or uncheck re relative time value before you right. can put in the value. Right. So it might be an order operations thing, but um, but if the four could be across, yeah, rather than mm -hmm. the two lines, I think that would make more sense visually. That's a good point. I can ask about that. Um, and then, so the other kind of part of this question, so if you go back to here um, and we want to view, oh, but that's not working. Why is that not working? Like you said, it was working like. Do you want the view, if you're viewing, do you want that to start with columns or filters? And not, if you're not editing, you're just viewing. So all this is grayed out. You can't change anything. You're just looking at it. Would you expect that to start on columns instead of filters? Yes. Okay. In well, ex head. except if you're viewing your report temp, like if you're viewing your report, the only thing that can be different from your templates is the values in the filters or can be different from the report output that you have in front of you. You know what I mean? That makes sense too. I'm not opposed to it going to columns, but I think I would normally be looking for the information in the filters to figure out, oh, this report output is this because I chose book as my surf modifier or something. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? And I will got to be clear that like eventually, you know, this is going to come down to what the tester 
you know, the partner tester says, and then eventually what the community testers say. Um, but by getting y'all's input up front, I'm hoping to minimize the amount of churn about these things uh, later on. Yeah, my first instinct was Colin, but then it does make sense to just go to filter and then at least it's consistent with the edit. So it's almost like anytime you open up a report thing, I can't think of words, it's the same. You're kind of yeah. doing the same okay. thing. Um, and then the last iteration of this, I don't think is actually in place yet. I don't think we have yet that in place yet. And we do not. Okay. Would be um, a, an action on this row to schedule the report. Um, so would you expect that to just drop you right in to the layouts and scheduling tab? Now that of course yeah, has to make it different than the other two, it makes it inconsistent, but in this case, it's a really specific thing. Yeah, you're specifically asking to schedule, mm -hmm. okay. correct? So I yeah. would want it to go to the thing I wanted to do. Agreed. Okay. And Beth says yes too, okay. Cool, well, thank you guys very much. That's really back, helpful. Back on the page before Andrea, uh -huh. When you're looking at reports, um, the clone option, is that the equivalent of the clone and save or uh, save as new? I mean, it's yes. We just decided to rename it clone to keep it consistent with the um, template terminology. So that's the same as editing um, and saving, you know, so you, you have edit yeah. and save, you have edit for your edit and overwrite the report and then clone is the edit and save as new. Um, I really like them being separate. Yeah. Cause they are kind of two different actions. Um, yeah. And we went, we went several rounds about, about allowing edit for templates. Um, I put, we're my not foot there down, yet. <laughs> I put my foot down hard and said, not this time. <laughs> I said, that is something that the community can discuss for future iterations. Not now. And we definitely, we, we, went a few rounds about that uh, internally. So <laughs> yeah, but can I, I, ask, I was, yeah. Can I ask one more question about a temp, if you go into one of the templates? Uh-huh. Just while we're here with the doctor, with the reports. Oh, wait, I'm group. in reports. I'm not in, oh, let's, sorry, my boss. Oh, there we go. Ah, sorry, help. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. This mm, is no. You want to start a new template? Yeah, because okay. it's not showing me the URL. The doc so the documentation URL mm -hmm. is my question. Yeah. For the reports interest group. Is there a better name for that? Because like is it actually documentation you'd want to link to or like, I think we have one report that links to documentation. Um, and I just don't know if like, if it should have a more generic name. Does anybody it. use documentation URL? We use it fairly often, like, um, a like official things. ones. But like, so with your report, what do you link to? We link to like a Google doc with like, or to our help desk with step-by-step -step instructions on how to run it. So the URL is telling you how to run the template. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you can see the URL. See, it, I think it just, the fact that it shows up in the email throws me. Like when you get your output, you get the link to the documentation URL as well. I actually didn't know that. Um, hmm. The main example I can think of is um, one of our basic weeding list reports. 
um, we have a link to our like leading documentation that has all the other steps that they use with the report. Um, yeah, I actually didn't know it. <laughs> um, emailed the link in the results. So that's yeah, I didn't know that either. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's something I've almost, I've basically never used it in the wild. Yeah, we use it for our circulation. We have a report that runs uh, to give what your circulation policies are, and we link it to our documentation on circulation policies. But I think that's the only one we currently do. Because it almost kind of seems like we need two. This one tells you how to do the template. This tells you what to do with the output the actual data that you've gotten. Yeah. We sometimes put um, how to run it um, in the description itself. It might be like the first paragraph that we put where, you know, put this value if you're looking for this or this for call number range and then put our paths. Um, yeah, I think we use the description actually way more than we use the documentation URL field. Yeah, and we're not really proposing any changes to that as a thing. It's just that's mm -hmm. just carried over from what it was. None of that is actually changing. Yeah. But it's worth, I think that's actually definitely worth a community conversation, you know, about where to put that kind of information. Well, since I saw it, I was like, and the reports people are here. Yeah. <laughs> um, one other question, Andrea, the template description, does it actually do paragraphs now? Because I think currently, even if you put a space in between, it all ends up as one when you save it. What do I want? Doesn't really matter. And we've lost the icons in the selector that tell hold, you what. Hold on, one question is. at a time. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it does not do paragraphs. I will put in a bug about that for the existing. Yeah, and and you can see on the mouse over here that yeah. it doesn't, and if I um expand that it does not because i've had a couple times where like susan you i've wanted to put in like this is what the report template does and this is how you use it and it'd be nice to have the break i'll i'll put in a bug for the existing one and yeah no the icons um i think i don't think we i think we intentionally left those out um but i can go back and I, look that's how I tell which one's the org unit, and which one's not when I'm picking. I'd have to go back unit. and look at yeah. look at my notes about that. I know we obviously, as is obvious, if you're familiar with the simple reporter, we reused a lot of components here, um, both to to kind of unify them, but also to cut down on the um, on the amount of original, you know, interface work that we would have to do. Mm -hmm. No, stop it. Someday I'll learn to, what double clicking means. This is something that I have to document or well. The fact uh, that you can double click is exciting. Yeah, and I want to show you guys what that's supposed to do um, in a sec, but no, I don't want to be on top of the reports. So. Yeah, I mean, like these are all kind of reused components. Mm -hmm from simple reports, um, which I also think also does not use the icons, but I can ask well, about that. I feel like we had this conversation. I cannot dredge it up right now, but. Because yeah. the icons are in templates because they're, when you go to select your different um, bits. Right. Um, like when you're if in your core sources type. Right. Oh, that's right. We don't have the icons. Oh, we but have, they have words. We have text. Right. Because we did talk oh, well, about yeah. this. 
because we didn't Excellent. talk about this and it was a translation thing and also a screen reader thing thank you oh my god i'm sorry if yeah stephanie, if stephanie i if was you ever... super confusing i was like icons stephanie if you ever watch this recording i am sorry that i i forgot that um <laughs> Yes, that's why <laughs> I'm like, no, wait, we didn't, we didn't skip this. We talked about this. I know we talked about this. Yes, that is, is because we put them as, um, you know, text. That's awesome. Yeah. And like link and, you know, integer, is there an integer or unit timestamp? Yeah, there's an integer one right there. So. And I think Andrea, you were going into the templates and seeing them when you were trying to go into a new one at one point? Because it looks like you can actually go in and look at your template, am I right? Or did you just end up in an unexpected spot? I did end up in an unexpected spot. Um, so let's talk about double clicking real quickly and what it does, and then I have to go. Um, it's also the top of the hour. Um, so I have, um, actually let's do one that's got um, more use on it. Okay, so here's the template. I'm double clicking on the template. That takes us to uh, the report now. Well, it looks like you could then set it up to run from that. Right, template. to set it up. So you could take that and that'll set it up to run a new report from that template. Um, you can also, from reports, double click on a report and you'll see output based on this report. So that will show you all the outputs based on that specific report. Um, and if you double click on output, you can see the output, which is what I kept screwing up before. Um, and if you come to outputs, um, like it's got the same bar chart, CSV, whatever, whatever options like you have. Mm -hmm. So double clicking on those will take you to your outputs as well. So that is, so there is like double clicking behavior now. It just needs to be um, more intuitive. Or I just need to learn it better. So yeah, you know, it takes you, and then you can create a new report, patron count to, you know. So this next button is a cute. Hmm. I really like that it shows the template I think, description on the side there. I'm pretty sure it does already, but I just, I, I like it on the side there. Sorry, I think something else might be breaking. Let me look at something. Yeah, okay. I, I made the classic error of not telling the developer that I was showing the interface. I think something just got pushed in the middle there, and that's why things stopped working. But you showed us all sorts of really cool things, Andrea. So thank you. Cool. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that you know. Uh, you guys got the the preview. Um, how do I stop sharing? I don't want new share. I want to not share. Um, there what? Should be a red a red button at the top. Ah, that says stop share. I swear I work with technology every day, you guys. Um, hold on, I want to go back and look at some of Beth's comments here. Link to debugging info. Oh, that's a good question. Um, maybe, let me see if Clark has fixed. There is um, on the on the grid, the output grid, there is a column that is available but not displayed by default for error text as well as run ID. Um, and if you look at the, um, if you open the output that opens that new window and gives you, it's, it's the same window that is there now mm -hmm. for outputs. Um, there is still that debugging info link there as well that will give you that so that output window hasn't changed it's just the same old one that's being invoked um and that gives you you know the generated sql the template the template data and all of that that you'd expect to see in debugging 
But linking that directly from the grid is an intriguing suggestion. I'll also put that on my list. Um, check, and I'm gonna make myself a note to double check the double click behavior in each location and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I swear I wrote down another detail there that was a little bit different than what it was just doing now, but this is why we test things. And this is why documentation doesn't get written until after we started testing things. If any of you have ever worked with me on a development project, I make you, I cruelly make you start testing without any real documentation. You just get test notes. Um, and it's because we're not going to spend like an entire week writing documentation when a bunch of this stuff is going to get sorted out and changed. Well, and also if you have too much documentation, you don't sometimes test things that aren't in the documentation yep. and things get missed and then discovered later. Well, there's no such thing as perfect testing anyway. No, absolutely not. Thank you for demoing that. That's really exciting yeah. to see. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And Thank you for your input. I really appreciate it. Great. Um, so we are past the hour, so I figured we would wrap up. Um, we don't have a topic for next month, so if anyone has anything that they're uh, really interested in talking about, uh, let me know. But otherwise, I'll find something. <laughs> I don't know what, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> but all right. So um, Hope you all have a, a lovely rest of your weekend, a long weekend if you're having one. I yes. assume everyone is. <laughs> okay. Great. Right, thanks. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Bye. everybody.